the next um, slide and tell you guys some um, tips that you can do yourself to boost your credit. Hello, my loves, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It is your big sis of YouTube, Cece, here. And I want to say thank you so much to almost a thousand new family members who have subscribed to my channel. And it's all because of these financial and debt videos that you guys have been watching, subscribing, and so I want to do more of them for you. So for today's video, I'm going to talk about how to raise your credit score 150 points between 7 to 14 days. Before I get started, I do want to make a disclaimer. If you have a high credit score, these tips will not work for you. These are for people who are trying to repair their credit down in the 300s, 400s, probably even the 500s. And these are all basic steps that I had taken when my credit score looked tragic and they helped me to raise my credit score and I saw an increase of 150 points in literally seven days. Also, I do want to say before I start as well, a second disclaimer, you can do all of these tips, but if you fall back into old habits, you will see your score decrease again and that defeats the whole purpose. So always make sure to keep moving forward. So the first tip that I can give you guys is to actually check your score. You can access your report on freecreditreport.com and you get up to three credit reports from the three different uh, reporting agencies. What I like to do with this is I'll just get one report every four months, three times a year, because um, you can get up to your three reports a year for free. So I'll get my one report every four months, and what I will do with that is just gauge my actual real score, because if you check it on Credit Karma or Credit Sesame, it could be between 40 to 50 points higher or lower. My score is actually 40 points higher than they report on Credit Karma, so that's like awesome for me to know. But um, I just use that to kind of make sure and monitor my accounts, make sure that no one is taking out credit in my name, my identity hasn't been stolen, and I get a general knowledge of what I have going on. But if you want an accurate representation of your credit score, you need to get your free report. So go on there, check out your report, get your basic score so you know what you're working with and you can see all of your derogatory marks, but also your positive things too, like your payments on time, your utilization going down. It's just great to be able to see that. Also, this video is not sponsored. That might have sound sponsored, but no, this is just me making this video for you guys. No one is paying me to make it. Okay, so after you've checked your score, what you want to do is go through and find your derogatory marks. These are things that you want to get back into good standing and that will bump your score up and you will almost see literally an instant score increase. So go through, find all of your derogatory marks, whether that's uh, collections that are on your report, whether that's missed payments, uh, whether you see something wrong too that you're like, uh, I didn't do that. Having that knowledge and being able to physically see it and work from it is what is key. So then you need to decide what you are going to pay or how you're going to go about it. So I've spoken briefly about paying off collections and I want to elaborate why I pay off the collection agency um, instead of actually paying the actual company itself because for me the pros outweigh the cons in a different way. So the collection agency offered me, let's say I had a bill of collections for $600 and for a reduced rate of 200, I can pay them 200 and just get it back into a normal good standing. It'll still be on my report, it won't be removed, but I'm taking that $400 discount on paying. Now, if you want it removed off your credit report, what you have to do is pay the actual company the full 600. So for me, I was just trying to get everything in order. I didn't have all the extra money to just pay it all off. So unfortunately, it is still on my credit report, but I got to pay it at the discounted rate. And I wanted it off as soon as possible. I wasn't looking to contact someone who's like a credit fixer or anything like that to take it into their own hands because I wanted something quick and easy. So it depends. If you have all the time in the world to wait, then you can contact someone who can help you out with that and kind of give you more of an insight and you pay them to do it, then awesome. But me, I was early 20s. I didn't have a lot of money, obviously, because I owed so many people money. So that is why I decided to just pay the collection agency itself. So that being said, the step that you need to take is deciding what you want to pay, how you want to pay, how you want to go about it. But I'm just speaking from my personal experience. I saw an insane jump in my credit score just from bringing back those negative accounts into a positive and good standing. This next one is going to be kind of difficult if you don't have this contact, but you need to find someone who has a great credit score, credit history, who pays all their bills on time, who can put you on their account. Now, you don't even have to have access to their credit card, you don't have to get a separate card for yourself, but just being added to someone's credit account shows on your credit report and your utilization is upped, and as long as they're making their payments and keeping their utilization low, this can really, really help you out insanely, because how it works is they base your credit score a certain percentage off of how much 
um, of credit you have is maximized. So if you're using it to the very max of the limit, then that's going to affect you in a negative way. But if you have it paid down, it's going to affect you in a positive way. So let's say, for example, my grandma, she has a credit card, she puts me on it, and she never uses it. Well, that's amazing because let's say she had a limit of like 4,000. It would show and reflect on my ratio, my credit of 4,000, showing that I didn't have anything taken out on that account. And so as you can see, this is kind of like a hack, a little bit to like cheat the system, but ugh, it's just, you have to be able to trust someone that much that you know, they pay their bills, they don't wanna have their credit up, up and away, and yeah, I just, I don't, I have trust issues. So for me, it's hard, but a family member who I know and I can trust, that really helped me just to be added to them. And it does not bring their score down. They are not a co-signer, you are just on there as another person. So that is a big myth that a lot of people have. Co-signing is a whole different thing, would I recommend it for many different reasons. If you want to see a video on that, let me know. My final tip for you guys is just to pay down your card utilization as much as you can if you have credit cards or credit lines, I guess, loans. Um, pay those down as much as possible so the utilization is down, especially the revolving ones. Revolving ones are like credit cards that come around every single month. You want to make sure you pay those down and be weary of interest, you guys. Do not just make the minimum payments because you're barely paying the interest. You need to be actually paying more than that. Be money smart. So if you want to see a whole credit card video too, I can do that also. I just accumulated so much knowledge from all of my horrible stupid mistakes that I've made. I just leave you with that to constantly see an up in your score. You want to make sure you are making your payments on time. You are making the full amount of your payments on time. You are actively showing these companies that you are making an effort. You are bettering yourself, and I promise you, give it time, and you will see your credit increase well up where you could never imagine. But these tips are just to get that 150 point bump that you need in 714 days. That is it, I'm done rambling for the day. If you guys liked this video, give it a big thumbs up, subscribe and share any tips or hacks that you guys have. In Alrighty you guys, so like I said, this is not a credit building um, class, but I did like this video because she did share a lot of tips. Now, of course, all of us don't have anybody who has, the, well, anyone that you know and trust that might just want to put you on as um, a, a second user on their account. But there are like multiple ways, and I always tell people research some ways to try to fix it yourself before you do spend the money and have someone to fix it for you. So like I said, I fixed my credit myself. I went from like a 450, 500, all the way to a 650, and that's when I was able to buy my home. So I tell people a lot of information is on Google and um, and YouTube. So that's where I do most of my research, and that's why I did a lot to build my credit enough to buy my first home. Moving on to the next thing. Okay, so the next thing is how to find the right loan officer. Now this is so important because this is gonna be the person or the point of contact who is gonna help you get the funding for your home, okay? Now I tell people, of course, credit is the first step. If your credit is good, then hey, let's go ahead and talk to a loan officer. If your credit isn't so good, let's fix it. And that goes back to the last video I sent you. So I mean, the last video I showed you. So this one is pretty much going to tell you the difference between a loan officer and a loan originator, okay? Which is important as well. Because like I said, those are going to be the two people that's going to help you finance your home in order for you to buy your home. Unless you have cash and you can just buy it outright. But if you don't have cash, then you will be going through a bank and you will be going through a loan originator or a loan officer, okay? So I'm just gonna play um, a little bit, probably like five minutes of this video, just so you can understand the difference between the two, okay? But like I said, this is gonna be the first person you talk to in terms of trying to get your finances together so you can purchase your home. So this is the first step, technically. Today we're gonna talk about what a loan officer or a loan originator does. Okay, so the loan officer or the loan originator is the person that picks up the phone when you call, right? They're the person that if you go online and you're looking for lectors, that's going to be the loan officer or loan originator, okay? It's a very important job, it's, and it's important that you guys understand what we're supposed to do. So I am a loan originator, so I'm going to talk to you about what my job is and what you guys should watch out for. So 
my job is to structure your loan. Okay, that is the biggest thing about my job is to structure your loan, to know the guidelines, to lock your rate, but then it's also my job to oversee the entire transaction to make sure that you get from start to finish in an appropriate manner. Now, the one thing most people don't realize about loan originators because everything's online, right? There's so much marketing that's like, oh, just fill out a two second application. We'll approve you. <laughs> it's nonsense. It's total nonsense. So I can tell you, we have everyone fill out online applications before I review them because that's the best way for me to get information. But the, the percentage of those applications that are correct, like actually correct, oh geez, less than 20%, less than 20%. Because the thing is, is that you guys don't know the guidelines that we have to follow. And the scary thing is, there's some loan officers that don't know the guidelines we're supposed to follow. There's no, uh, you know, yes, there's licensing tests, but the licensing tests actually don't cover very useful stuff. They cover stuff like, um, what year was this law passed? Who cares? Or um, what regulation protects this? Once again, who cares? right? Be ethical. Don't do horrible shit. Oh, <laughs> don't discriminate and you will be fine. Okay. Um, so when people are coming into the, the market as loan officers, they may not know any guidelines, like any, any, and then it depends on where they work. So if you work at a bank, you're going to have one set of guidelines. If you work as a broker, you're going to be working with multiple lenders with multiple sets of guidelines. If you work where I work, which is, uh, you know, a correspondent lender, I have to know like 15 sets of guidelines at any given time. And then if you're dealing with something like VA, FHA, you know, that's a whole other layer of guidelines, nuances, um, shades of gray that I, as the loan officer, need to know, right? Your loan officer that you guys are looking to work with, you want them to be a guideline Bible, or you want them to be cognizant enough to go, you know what? I don't know that. Let me check with an underwriter. I probably say that five times a day. So I've been doing this for 14 years, hundreds and hundreds of loans closed, right? Thousands. I still don't know everything and I am aware enough. All right. So I'm going to pause here because I hope a lot of you all get the gist, but if you didn't, I'm going to recap for this. And this is so important. You want to make sure that your loan officer or your loan originator know what they're doing. That is so important because literally that's going to be the person who takes all your information and make sure you get to the closing table. So um, I do have a list of lenders that I personally have relationships with that I do refer out to people because I've seen their work, I know their credentials. But of course you can always go and find your own lender, like for instance, um, you can go through the bank that you bank with. You can use them as someone who can finance your mortgages. But um, I personally wanted to touch bases on, well, actually, let me tell you about my situation real quick. When I was going through the home buying process um, years ago. So I had a lender who pre-qualified me for a certain amount which is a kind of lower amount, but because I was working at the car dealership, I had to be there for at least a year before he was able to use my full income um, because I was salary and I was commissioned. But uh, needless to say, um, I didn't really get along with him, but despite that, he did know what he was doing and that was a blessing because he did take my loan from point A to point Z, which is closing. But um, needless to say, a loan officer is so important. And like I said, you want to make sure that you find someone that is going to get you to point A to point Z, point blank period. So now the next one I'm going to get to is going to be, let me see if I can move this. The little toolbar is um, hiding the, um, the caption up top. But pretty much, when you're looking for a lender, you have to make sure that lender matches your vibe, matches your mold, which is so important. So going back to my situation, I had a lender. He did take us from start to finish, which was a blessing. 
but I wasn't a fan of his attitude. He was more of a straightforward type person, but he was straightforward and lacked communication skills. Um, he wasn't an on the phone type of talker. He was more of, hey, I'm working, leave me alone, I'm gonna get you there. I don't like that. I like someone who's gonna keep me in a loop of what's going on with my deal. Cause like I said, that loan originator should be your best friend because that loan originator is gonna be the one working your deal. And you want someone who's gonna work your deal fail fairly. You want someone who's gonna work your deal, who's not gonna discriminate against anything. So um, uh, luckily he didn't discriminate, hopefully he didn't discriminate, but he did finish my deal. But um, needless to say, you just want someone who's going to be, who, who matches what, you, what you're what you looking for. Like for instance, if you're um, personable, you need someone that's personable. You need someone who's bubbly, you need someone who's upbeat, get someone like that. Um, if you're straightforward, if you're like, okay, just tell me what it is, you know, then find someone that's straightforward. If you're straightforward, you shouldn't have a lender who likes to talk a lot. You know, if you're not a talker. Well, it just depends, you know. And also tech versus tech. You have some lenders who are old school lenders who um, whose tech skills aren't the best. Do you have some lenders who are very tech savvy, who can send everything via email? They're pretty high tech. Um, so you definitely want to find which matches your mold, especially when they're the one handling your deal. All right. So when you're in that process of looking for a lender, you need to ask certain questions. So some of the questions is, what is the minimum credit score? Now you have some lenders that can take a lower credit score, like the 580 range, like I told you. Then you have some lenders that only take 620 and up. And actually they did pass a law um, during COVID where a lot of lenders did um, up their uh, credit score minimum. So you definitely want to ask that question prior to them running your credit. You know, don't let them run your credit. You know, they, they take a 620 and you're like a 572. It just doesn't make sense. You don't want to uh, waste those points. The next question is, what programs do they offer for first-time home buyers? You want to ask that question. You want to see, hey, what do you offer for people like me in my situation? What can you give me? So the biggest thing too, I'm gonna piggyback off of this one too. You wanna to try to get the most money from these lenders because they do have money, you know, but of course, sometimes you do have to ask for it. So you do wanna ask them what programs and different grants that they have. The next um, question is, do they offer any lender credits? So lender credits are credits that they give you during closing. Like sometimes, like for new construction home, they might give you $4,000 for lender credits or whatever the case may be. So that's just extra money that they have to give away. The next one is, do they offer appraisal waivers? So appraisal waivers, and we'll talk about appraisals later on in the process, well, later on in the um, presentation. And with some uh, lenders, they do waive that fee because that fee could be like anywhere from $450 to $500. So um, these are just ways to save you more money. Well, ask these questions to save you more money. The next question is, do they have any down payment assistance? So um, certain lenders, well, banks have down payment assistance like Chinoa or Georgia Dream. You definitely want to ask those questions to see if they do, especially if you don't have that much money to bring to the table. The next question is, how quick can they close? That is so, um, so important. You got some lenders who can close under 30 days, which is ideal. Any lender that tells you 30, 35, well, I won't say 30, 35, 40 days to close, you don't want to do it, especially in this market because it's so competitive in this market right now. You want to have a lender who's on it. You want to have a lender who's, um, who's able to close quick. The next question is, how long have they been in the industry? That's another question or a point that um, my last video made. You want to make sure that um, lender has been in the game for a little bit so they know the tricks and trades and how to get you to the closing table. Not saying that new lenders don't have that skill set, but the longer the lender has been in the industry, the better, I say. All right. So the pre-qualification process, so this is pretty much the process that you're going to go through once you have found your lender, found someone that meets, um, that fits your mold, and you feel comfortable enough doing business with them, okay? So I'm just going to play a little uh, snippet of this video, and then I'll piggyback off of um, versus pre qual Actually, I'm going to talk about it now. So pre-qualification versus pre-approval. The pre-qualification is pretty much what you'll get. Well, this is kind of like in comparison what you'll get in the mail. Like you'll see, hey, you've been pre-qualified for a $500 Visa debit card. Not debit card, but um, credit card. Pre-approval 
is when you actually filled out that application, they pulled your credit and said, okay, great, you're pre-approved. Do you want to accept the offer or not? So I recommend always getting pre-approved. Pre-qualification is cool, but it's very generic. Pre-approval um, pre is point blank, hey, you're actually approved for this amount. You're ready to go home shopping. So I'm just gonna play this a little bit so you can get more information on that. And this lady here is an actual lender. Hello, you are tuning into the Chic Mortgage Millennial. So hope all of you all are doing well. Thank you so much for tuning into my videos. I know that people have said 